thank you very much for being here and good morning. I would like to begin with an informal survey um, by a show of hands. How many here have leafleted? Great. How many have written a letter to the editor? Great. How many have engaged in a demonstration or a protest? Outstanding. How about this? How many have approached a local restaurant or a campus cafeteria to uh, offer vegan entrees? Outstanding. Well, obviously, these are all models of activism. And they're all important because you never know what is going to inspire somebody. You never know what's going to uh, make them understand that their choices as, as consumers contribute to animal suffering. Now, <clears throat> those examples aside, what do I mean by animal activism? Well, for me, animal activism is compassion in action. Most people abhor cruelty to animals. The problem is they almost never see it. And when they do, they think it's an isolated incident. Of course, when they see it, they're shocked. Witness the public outrage at the torture of downer cows at the Westland Slaughterhouse in California earlier this year. But again, most people thought that was the exception. So the job of the activist is to access people's innate compassion by showing them that the horrors of animal exploitation are literally everywhere. And once they see they are contributing to practices they actually oppose, people are inclined to re-examine their behaviors, to reevaluate their consumer choices. And that's a start. Admittedly, it's not everything, but it's a start. Now, I'm going to be mentioning veganism a lot, which begs the question, do you have to be vegan to be an animal activist? Well, technically, no. I guess you don't. But I think you should. I believe that animal activism begins with us, so let's start by not exploiting animals ourselves. Well, in the course of researching my book on activism, I interviewed more than 100 activists around the world. And many of these activists are engaged full time in animal protection. But for the most part, they are full time students, or they have jobs outside the movement, or both. In other words, they're a lot like most of us here. Yet even in their spare time, they manage to be incredibly effective for animals. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Tim Martin, an activist in Southern California. Uh, Tim volunteers with PETA's writers group. And even in his spare time, he manages to be one of the most prolific writers of letters to editors I know. Then there are activists like Patty Mark in Australia. Patty pioneered the open rescue model of activism. Uh, this is a form of direct action in which activists go into factory farms or vivisection labs. They don't do anything to disguise their identities. They document what they see. They rescue sick and injured animals, placing them into loving homes. And they release their findings to the public, either through their website or using the media. Well, Patty was so incensed by animal abuse that she founded Animal Liberation Victoria and is engaged full time in animal protection. So I'm going to be talking about <clears throat> what I learned from activists like Patty and Tim and some of the activists that are here today and how their endeavors have informed my own activism. But before I do, there are a number of myths about animal activism. And I'd like to address a few of those. I do this because these misconceptions can be a barrier, both to you as an activist and to the person you're speaking to. The first myth is animal activists hate people. Well, this 
belief that we are misanthropes is admittedly a tough one to shake. Activists hear comments all the time like, uh, oh, you people would rather save a rat's life than cure cancer. Now, conveniently ignoring the direct link between consuming animals and acquiring a life-threatening disease. Uh, or they'll say something like, you know, there are so many homeless people out there, how can you waste your time helping animals? Well, the truth is, animal activists have a long history of being engaged in other social reforms. Even 19th century activists understood that animal abuse, child abuse, and domestic abuse all spring from the same well. Now, I highly recommend you read a book called For the Prevention of Cruelty by Diane Beers, who goes into uh, much more detail on this topic. Now, if you find yourself embroiled in this debate, somebody accusing you of being a, a misanthrope, try to bring animals back into the discussion. For example, let's say you're uh, at Kentucky Fried Chicken and you're leafleting or protesting, and somebody says, uh, you know, there are millions of people starving in Africa. How could you be out here helping chickens? You might say something like, well, I agree. There are lots of people who need help. But helping chickens and other animals raised for food does not require us to do anything extra. Just stop eating them. You might also quote Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail in which he wrote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Myth number two, animal activists have to have all the answers. Well, no we don't. Nobody has all the answers. In fact, aren't we a little suspicious of the person who seems to know it all? Now, I highly recommend you read everything you can get your hands on in terms of animal rights. Absorb it. There's so much information out there. We need to learn as much as we can. We owe it to the animals. But that doesn't mean that you have to be an expert. You don't have to memorize a lot of facts, a lot of numbers, a lot of ratios, like it takes 16 pounds of grain to produce one pound of beef, or how many animals are killed in vivisection labs every year. In fact, nobody knows. Ultimately, all you have to know is that you do not wish to support the suffering of animals.